a musician, a long distance kayaker, a businessman. She looks after animals, artist, author. We interview remarkable people. They're talented in so many different areas. You're listening to The Dialogue, 89.7 FM Eastside Radio. You're listening to 89.7 FM Eastside Radio. This is Natasha and The Dialogue Show, where I interview remarkable people. On the show today, I have Narelle Anderson, who is the founder and MD of EnviroBank. And we have been chatting for the last I think 45 minutes about life love we've had a cry we've had a laugh I think we've pretty much touched on everything I I, I seriously feel like you and I are best friends and it's really exciting to interview someone who is so extraordinary you really are Narelle a really extraordinary woman thank you and thank you for like coming on the show and, and talking about the stuff that you've done now one of the things that happened when I walked in today to, to interview you was I, I almost walked past you because I was briefed that you are you, you are an indigenous woman and that you know this is something that's very close to your heart and I actually expected to see someone who looked far more indigenous than you do I'm going to describe you to the listeners you are blonde 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 fair 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 and, you know, in, in no way when you first meet you would you have any inkling that you are Indigenous. But you are fully a, a, a woman of Australia. I am. And, you know, there's a funny saying that I see rolling around on the internet at the moment. And that is, you know, even when you add milk to tea, it's still tea. And really, um, you know, I guess that kind of talks a little bit about my Aboriginality as well. You know, it's really not. Um, what you look like on the outside it's who you are on the inside and and certainly I am an Aboriginal woman and my mother is an Aboriginal woman and my grandmother and my great-grandfather and and that's who I am but people often get confused I would imagine so I I do dye my hair just quietly by the way so it's yeah, but you know, <laughs> it's still going with that whole kind of. It's technically of, bottle blonde. You, you, you <laughs> sort of, you, 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 you're kind of channeling a very Swedish kind of look. You know, you look very sort of Northern European. But actually, very interestingly, when you started talking to me and I said that to you, you said, you know, look at my cheeks and look at my nose. And when I started to do that, I suddenly saw, I just saw our Australian Indigenous people in your face. It was phenomenal. It, it is. You are so much a part of this land which is kind of incredible and you said that you had a really interesting meeting with a woman at a finance talk and she kind of really solidified for you what what did she say Um, I was at a women's business conference and um, there was an auntie at the conference and I was um, sitting I actually walked past her on the plane and then I happened to be sitting next to her at one of the working um, sessions and I said to her oh auntie you know I'm I'm indigenous also and um, she grabbed my hand and she looked at me and she said to me, um, I know you're Indigenous. Your problem is that you don't know you're Indigenous. You have this, you know, you're a black girl walking around in what looks like a white girl's body and you know that that's not who you are. And so we sat in this session and, you know, cried and, um, you know, I was telling her the story of my family and how um, my journey for connecting back um, to culture and the poor lady that was running the finance session was really quite confused as to why we would find finance so sad. Uh, um, And we had to explain to her later that we were having our own little um, conversation and, um, you know, really it was a very empowering moment for me and really part of the journey for me to get um, back to my uh, roots and get back to my culture and really get involved. Now, you come from some fairly um, impressive stock. I mean, Neville, it's Bono, isn't it? Bono, uh, yes. Bono was, you know, your... Um, Neville Bono is my uh, great uncle, my grandmother's um, brother and the first Indigenous man elected um, to Parliament. And, you know, obviously I'm very proud of that. And like um, Senator Neville Bonner, I feel passionately about making opportunities for Indigenous people. And I do that um, every day in my recycling company. And, and, you know, every day when I meet and greet uh, people, just look at ways um, to help other people, particularly Indigenous entrepreneurs. You know, I I often go out and tell my story you know, not necessarily to business uh, groups, but really to children. Um, I feel really passionately about um, showing our um, our next generation um, what you can do. 
and um, and certainly, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're um, black, white, or otherwise. If you if you have a willingness um, to work, um, that anything's possible, and that's really the story that I go out and tell. You're listening to 89.7 FM Eastside Radio. This is Natasha and The Dialogue Show, where I interview remarkable people. On the show today, I have Narelle Anderson, who is the founder and MD of EnviroBank. Interestingly, the business that you've actually set up, um, you know, EnviroBank um, is all about giving back. It's all about sort of reward. It's a reward-based business, which is so phenomenal. So, you know, it's... That that kind of seems to be a very big part of who you are and you know the legacy that you have. Now you were born in in Sydney and went to school, but obviously didn't love school because you decided at fourteen years and nine months that you were going to leave school um, and go and work, and then you actually left home at sixteen. So you were just this completely you were a massive risk taker right from the beginning. Did you realize you were a risk taker? Um. No, I didn't realise then that I was a risk taker uh, as such. I just had, you know, a belief in myself and really, you know, have always been a very determined individual and I was um, determined um, to make my own way and and pay my own way and and I decided that I would um, leave home at 16 and and off I went into the workforce and, um, and never really looked back. You said one of the first jobs you had was making donuts. Yes, I'm not a very good donut maker. Apparently, they're meant to be round um, with a hole in the middle, and mine were neither round nor did they have a hole in the middle. Um, in fact, they resembled the dinosaur donut that um, is quite popular today and actually quite expensive. <laughs> so you, 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 I mean, you were an entrepreneur even at those at that stage. I was, you know, certainly a trailblazer way back then. <laughs> I don't think baking and cooking maybe is your thing because you also told me that when you used to go and visit your dad when he was unwell, you used to make him really terrible scones. Yes, I used to uh, because I left home so early and I have um, a younger sister that was 10 years younger than me and my um, parents still at home. My dad was actually quite sick. I would go home on Sundays to watch the football with my father and make him scones and they were quite possibly the worst scones that you could ever eat. They were very, very hard, very, very dense. And um, God bless my dad. He used to eat them all and smile. And I'm not sure how he did that, but he did. Well, you know what? It, I think he re- recognized the love. Now, you came from a family of girls yes. and were very close to your younger sister. I was. Who actually did get herself very involved in the Aboriginal community and the Indigenous community. And she kind of dragged you, tried to drag you back into that into that world. You know, kept on asking you to kind of go back into that world. And you said that the large part of you, you know, sort of embracing your heritage and your culture was due to her yeah because I left home um, when I was 16 and really just went out into the workforce my younger sister Cassandra was very close to my mother and and really took the time um, in fact she interviewed my mother um, to hear about the stories of my mother's um, life and my grandmother's life and she would say to me and and she worked a lot in community um, and for indigenous not-for-profits and she would say to me when I came home look you you know you really need to be able to you know to come and help me do these things because you have great connections and you know I really think that if you helped me that we could do some wonderful things and you know I was just so busy doing my own thing um, very selfishly and it wasn't really until she passed away that I understood the importance of what um, what she was saying to me and from that moment on you know I made a conscious decision to um, find out more about my mother's um, story and my grandmother's story and and the journey of um, Neville Bonner and get involved in community and start to use you know my capabilities to bring um, to make a difference in community with our people and that's you know, that's really the mandate um, for the company that I own today. That's really our purpose and our, our mission. You know, we do reward people for recycling and I'm extremely passionate about uh, making opportunities in community where there are no um, opportunities at the moment and providing employment and jobs and economic benefit. Your sister committed suicide. She did, yes. Which is just, you know, must have been shocking for all of you. And was it unexpected? Um, yeah, she, well, no, she, um, she was quite, um, troubled for some time and, and, you know, she was my younger sister, but more like my child, my relationship with her was more a mother daughter relationship than a a sister relationship. So it was really very, um, devastating for me. So 
in her in her passing really that was a, her work that she was doing in community was really important to her and and so now it's become equally mm. important to important me important to you as i was saying earlier you know you have an amazing legacy you have an amazing you know god has given you an incredible job to do we were laughing when you first came in here we were talking about you know sort of being lost and you said that you actually had a rethink recently about what you're doing in the world and I mean I I sort of you know sort of took it quite lightly and then when we started to talk I sort of thought god no you you know you're amazing so recently you've actually had a bit of a health scare which has given you that sort of you know you've revisited your your purpose how did that happen well I was doing two things recently that made me think about um, my purpose to make sure that I'm on the right path and I think that's important that we do that from time to time to check in to make sure that we're are you know living our life's um, passion and purpose because that obviously makes things easier. The first thing was that I was filling in a lotto um, ticket and um, the prize was forty million dollars and I was writing down oh, you know wouldn't it be wonderful if I won this and what would I do? And the first um, um, realization was if I won forty million dollars um, I would actually still still do what I'm doing and and just give a whole lot more um, away. Um, so that kind of ticked the box but then I got quite ill and I ended up um, finding out that I had a tumour and I had to have that um, removed and had quite a serious uh, operation so when you're faced with your mortality um, obviously you start to question again am I doing what I'm um, supposed to be doing is this is this really um, you know what my legacy is going to be and and again for me the answer is is yes I'm you know just committed and, and feel very passionate that what my um, company does and the conversations that I have in community and, and the work that we do um, is in line with my life purpose and, it, and is in fact my legacy. You're listening to 89.7 FM Eastside Radio. This is Natasha and The Dialogue Show, where I interview remarkable people. On the show today, I have Narelle Anderson, who is the founder and MD of EnviroBank. You were laughing because you said that when you went in and the, the tumor was on your adrenal gland and you have one on either side and apparently that's supposed to be your fight and flight, um, you know, sort of you know, a mechanism. And what did you tell the doctor? Well, first of all, I thought it was very, well, not funny, but, you know, it made, made sense to me totally that I would have a tumor on my um, adrenal gland because that is the stress hormone and obviously running a company from, from time to time can be a little um, stressful and I do, you know, I work um, extraordinary hours. Um, and then I was getting into the conversation around the purpose of the adrenal gland and it was explained to me it produces adrenaline and cortisol and um, it's responsible for fight and flight. And I did make a comment to the surgeon, well, if you're going to take one out, um, you know, please don't take out the fight one because I actually need that one. Do you, do you feel that the, the recycling um, environment is something that you've had to fight for? Do you feel that that is something that you, you, you know, you've been in waste for a very long time. One of the first jobs you had was in a waste company that you actually landed up buying, which, you know, what made you decide that you, as this young woman, could buy a waste company and turn it into success? Um, I just have a crazy belief that, you know, I can do anything that I set my mind to. And um, in fact, for me, if somebody tells me that I can't do something, uh, that just makes me 10 times more determined to prove that it can be done. And certainly 17 years ago when I started um, in the waste management um, business, I, you know, I was obviously um, much younger and really, you know, it was quite extraordinary to see a woman um, running a waste management company. I ran garbage trucks. And I ran a material recovery facility. Um, I worked for a gentleman that owned a small business and he wanted to sell the business and I wanted um, to stay in the business and I didn't have any money. So I really talked him into letting me run the business and um, it wasn't making money at the time. And I said, look, I think I can turn this around and when it makes some profit, I'll kind of pay you for the business if you let me have a go and and he did and really that was the beginning of my career in in waste management and it's certainly been um, a challenge along the way and there's been a little bit of um, fighting I, <laughs> to say the least <laughs> so a bit of that uh, a bit of a, you know the boxing gloves on you sold that company I did for a fortune to a public listed company I mean you got bought out someone turned around and went we want what you have done at that moment did you have a sense of 
I've done it. Like, did you, were you aware of how brilliant, you know, the business was that you had kind of grown? At the time when I um, was approached and the company um, was purchased, for a start, I always had a plan that I would turn the business around and sell the business um, in five years. And it, in fact, took two years. So just if you're a budding entrepreneur out there, things always take longer than you expect. So don't, please don't be dis- you know, disheartened. Keep going. Um, it will happen. Um, so, so the first thing I was like, oh, well, that, that took two years longer. And I did think that I would, you know, stop and take a risk because obviously that's the nirvana when you sell a company to a public company. That's kind of a good thing. Um, and I stayed at home for two weeks sort of contemplating my navel and figured out that that's really not for me and started a company again because I... Um, In fact, recently when I was in hospital, I had my blood um, pressure taken and when I'm sitting still, my blood pressure is extremely high. Um, but when I'm active and working, it's actually quite low. So it's actually not good for me health wise. No, you, no you can't. You can't. Obviously, can't. Says, you're listening to 89.7 FM Eastside Radio. This is Natasha and the Dialogue Show, where I interview remarkable people. On the show today, I have Narelle Anderson, who is the founder and MD of Envirobank. Is as we said, it's about rewarding people for recycling. So let's just talk about the fact that, um, you know, currently in New South Wales. It's not something that works, but it does work. You've got a really big depot in the Northern Territory and in some other areas. So just explain to me how this business works because it's quite fantastic. So um, EnviroBank, was, is, we started in Sydney actually with reverse vending machines. And as a, you know, from my previous company, we had a lot of public place contracts and could see that the bins were contaminated. And and in the when ab- you say the bins are contaminated, what does that mean? So that means that um, if you look in a recycling bin and it has anything other than recycling material in it, um, then that's considered contamination, which means that that material then ends up um, in landfill um, because it's classified as a separate waste um, type. So the trick to good recycling is to get the recycling placed in the right bin, um, obviously without um, the contamination, and that's about having a conversation with the consumer. And um, so I started EnviroBank and in the absence of container deposit legislation, which is uh, which at the time was in South Australia, where you get 10 cents back for the um, beverage containers, we um, started a reward and recycling program using this um, technology and then moved um, into South Australia and the Northern Territory where the legislation did exist. So uh, what we do in those um, states where the container deposit legislation exists is actually pay people for recycling and what we pay them is 10 cents for every one of those qualified containers that fit um, under that scheme. And the good news is that in um, New South Wales on the 1st of December, it's back. Recycling is back. So exciting. Um, Cash for Containers is back. And we used to have Cash for Containers many, many years ago. It was run by one of the metal recycling companies called Cash for Cans. Really, that's what um, container deposit recycling is. It's cash for cans, but it includes more products. So does your company pay the 10 cents? No. Or does the government pay the 10 cents? No. um, The the 10 cents is actually um, paid by by the consumer, really. The beverage industry um, attaches the deposit um, to uh, to the product, and then when the consumer returns it, that deposit is returned to them. Ah, okay. So say my can's a hundred, hundred. Say my can's one dollar fifty. It would be one dollar sixty. And so when it comes back, that ten cents would then comes back come, come back to you. Yeah. So what can we recycle? What is in these? What is in our re- reverse cycle vending machines? Um, the easiest way to explain what qualifies in a container deposit um, legislation is single use beverage container. So you know that's um, aluminium cans. Um, PET bottles, plastic bottles, so water bottles, HDPE, which are your milk bottles, um, liquid paperboard, which is your um, chocolate move containers, um, and glass, um, Mm. glass um, beer bottles traditionally, um, wine bottles and large milk bottles um, sit outside the system. Let's talk about coffee cups, plastic coffee cups. Are we ever going to get to recycle these co- these plastic coffee <laughs> cups? Because, you know, I I was always under the Don't impression. Don't use them. That's the yeah. Shortest. I was always under the impression that because they were a, you know a paper product, they were recyclable. Um, it it depends on the manufacturer, but a lot of these um, paper coffee cups are wax lined, which um, takes them into a different um, category. And the thing about um, waste is that it is 
it is valuable if it can be reused. So we really have to be mindful in the future about how we construct um, our packaging um, to put around our products so that it can be uh, recycled. And that's what generally happens with products that may be primarily um, made out of a recyclable product, but it may have another product in it. And obviously, um, coffee paper cups need to be wax lined, otherwise the burning hot coffee goes through them. Um, goes through them. So there's a purpose. Um, there's a purpose for that. I think what's happening in community at the moment uh, is we are more mindful of the impact that we're having on the planet, and we are looking um, at alternatives for you know the way that things have been done um, in the past, and and what can we do in the future. You are also a part of the Green Council. I can never ever say it. Green Council Australia, Australia, Australia Green Council. <laughs> um, yeah. So when the Green, I was a. Found- can you just tell me exactly what the word is? Green the- Building Council. Thank you. The Green Building Council, for some reason, never stays inside my head. Yeah. So in a, in my first company, I was um, a founding one of the founding members of the Green Building Council. Um, it's been a long time since I've been in the Green Building Council. I am a director on um, ACOR, which is the Australian Council of Recyclers Association, so I'm still very active in the recycling um, space. Do, do people come to you, you know, when when they talk about waste and when they talk about carbon? I mean, do they come to you? Do you have a, a, a huge amount of knowledge around this area? I mean, obviously you've set up your own business, but I would imagine that you would be considered to be an expert and an authority within this area. Um, I do. I do have a lot of conversations with various, um, you know, members of the business community and and um, government and consumers alike, um, because it's my passion. It's my business, obviously. So, and I've been doing it for seventeen years. So, so I know a little bit. Um, but it's also my great passion. And um, you know, I run a recycling business at the moment. Who that's you know, pinned around a container deposit legislation, but I'm interested in lots of other things in the recycling uh, space and I'm always having conversations around that. Once I've put my glasses or whatever the case may be into the reverse cycle vending machine, then obviously that machine is cleared. What happens to the product then? So depending on the product, um, will determine its destination. So if it's aluminium, for example, um, it will make its way to a metal recycling um, facility. And aluminium is a fantastic product um, to recycle because it can be infinitely recycled. Um, PET will make its way. The PET from a container deposit legislation is a really high quality product and, and will most likely make its way um, back to a packaging company so it can be um, reprocessed. Um, glass again um, goes back to a glass beneficiation um, plant where it can be um, reused um, into a new glass product and liquid paperboard um, and cardboard um, also get recycled again um, as in some form of packaging. You're listening to 89.7 FM Eastside Radio. This is Natasha and The Dialogue Show, where I interview remarkable people. On the show today, I have Narelle Anderson, who is the founder and MD of EnviroBank. So everything has a future. Everything has a future life. If I were to ask you what your sort of Nirvana idea of, um, you know, an eco-friendly environment would be, what would it be to you? Well, I think that what's really exciting about the waste um, space at the moment is um, the waste is a new currency and that's what we really need to be thinking about. We're hearing about lots of new currencies and ways to transact and do business in the world, you know, hearing about Bitcoin and all of that kind of thing. Um, And waste is actually one of those new great currencies and and it will um, have the opportunity to um, change people's lives. It's a currency that will be easily accessible to everybody Um, And it is a currency that can quite literally change people's lives and um, significantly have an impact on the planet. You know, there's, um, I'm sure that everybody's seen the infographic um, that's rolling around that, you know, if we don't do something about the plastics in the ocean, that there'll be more plastics than fish in the ocean Mm. um, by 2050. And that's a really, you know, that's a really scary thing. And if we're going to have any kind of impact and we need um, to be thinking about changing behaviours in life, there's two ways to change behaviours, the carrot or the stick, right? Um, and rewards for recycling and incentivizing recycling and the legislation um, that incentivizes people to recycle, you know, is a wonderful carrot. And I have yet to find um, somebody that's, um, you know, that doesn't think that recycling and getting paid to recycle, um, you know, is a bad idea. We're coming towards the end of the interview. I've got two more questions for you. One is, um, you said that 
the the process of, of, of cash for recycling has actually transformed people's lives where you have some phenomenal stories about some people. So, you know, what is the impact for people when they're able to be able to do this? Well, I think what's really important um, to remember, first of all, we do have a lot of um, people in Australia that actually live below um, the poverty line. And, you know, Cash for Containers actually gives people an opportunity um, to fund um, their own lives. So, you know, locally make a difference. In the Northern Territory, we have a significant depot in the Northern Territory. We process something like 150 to 200,000 um, containers a day. And we always ask um, people, you know, what is it that you do with your cash for containers money and how, you know, how does it make a difference for you? And some of the things that people um, tell us are, you know, they use the money to send their kids to after school activities. And I know if you've got kids at school, you know that every week there's a note that comes home and there's a new excursion and you've got to find another 20 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever it is. And that's really hard to do when you're working on a, working at a job with a fixed income. You can't exactly go to your boss every week and ask for a little bit more money because something's come up. Um, so, so they're used for general things. People... Um, Lots of people actually use their money um, for charity purposes and send money overseas um, and support local charities. You know, others um, save up for holidays that they've never been able to afford um, and we really love that. There's a lot of money that's spent on travel and we're really excited to hear about the places that people go. Um, so much so that we're talking um, to an airline partner at the moment about how, you know, how we can make that, um, take that journey even further if you like. And then the other thing that people do is they just buy the, you know, the basic essentials and that's, and that's bread and milk. And when we hear those stories, it sort of rings home that, you know, this really does make a difference um, in little ways and, and big ways. And that's exciting. And it's exciting um, for me and for my team to be part of that. Last question. Last quick question. The one of the things that happened when you got your cancer scare was that you decided that you needed better balance. You have a beautiful seven-year-old child that you are absolutely in love with. And what, how are you going to achieve that balance? What is, what is the thing that's going to stop you from, you know, hitting that adrenal gland? Um, I think I probably need to take some of my um, own, own advice. And uh, I'm just really actually going to reorganize my diary a little bit and, and perhaps not work the 20 hours a day that I work and kind of take it down um, to 12. It's, that's hard to do because when you're so passionate about something, I don't look at the hours in the day. For me, it just, you know, everything just um, melds into one. But I'm going to take some more holidays is the first thing that I'm going to do. And I have organized school holidays coming up. Seem to be a lot of school holidays. I'm always amazed by how many school holidays there are. I don't remember having that many school holidays when I was at school. It was some time ago and I did leave early. Um, um, but I am going to um, take some more time out with my family and enjoy some special family holidays. We've come to the end of the interview. I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, it's been fascinating and I know that your business is a business of the future and you are going to leave an incredible legacy for all of us. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me.